Hello everybody and welcome back to Ginge Under the Sea. Today we are going to be talking about shark facts. We're going to be covering loads of really interesting details about sharks. So let's get stuck in. First of all, some of the illustrations in this video are from the FAO Guide for Sharks and Rays of the Western Indian Ocean. You can see it here. Really amazing guide that you can download for free and get loads of information on those shark species. But let's dive straight in. So first of all, we're going to look at the fins and some of the external anatomy. What we have along the top side of the shark, which is what we call the dorsal side, are their two dorsal fins. Most shark species have both dorsal fins, so first dorsal fin and a smaller second dorsal fin near their tail. As we move back, we can see their tail fin, otherwise known as the caudal fin, and they have an upper and lower lobe. And then as we move to the underside of the shark, this is known as the ventral side. Near the front, they have a pair of pectoral fins. And as we move back, we get to their pair of pelvic fins. And then finally, they have an anal fin that is positioned just before the caudal fin and is basically a mirror image of their second dorsal fin. Again, not all shark species have a second dorsal fin and an anal fin, but the vast majority do. Other features we can see on this illustration are also their gill openings, which are situated just behind their head. And this is unique to sharks to have these exposed gill openings or sharks and rays. And then on the ventral view, we can see the shark's vent, which is where waste is deposited and also where fertilization happens for females. So now we're gonna look at how sharks differ from other fish. The vast majority of fish you see in the ocean, particularly the ones on coral reefs and the fish we eat are bony fish or otherwise known as teleosts. So they have this complex bony structure, it also includes a lot of other materials like cartilage, tendons, ligaments, and therefore is very complicated and heavy. Bony fish also have a swim bladder. This is a gas-filled sac inside their body that they can contract and relax to adjust their buoyancy, which is where they will float in the water, whether they will float up or sink down or stay neutral in the water. And finally, teleos or bony fish also have very flexible pectoral fins. This means that they can actually use their pectoral fins for propulsion forwards and backwards. So they don't only rely on their tail fin, they actually use their pectoral fins to adjust their position in the water, but also propel them forwards and backwards. See in this video here, this big friendly potato grouper, you can see his pectoral fins are working hard to keep him in that stable position. You can see they propel him forwards and backwards, and he just uses those pectoral fins in a very flexible manner to adjust his position in the water. Okay, so let's move on to sharks now. How do they differ from what we were just talking about with teleosts? First of all, sharks have a very simple cartilaginous structure. If you don't know what cartilage is, it's that material that's in your ears and in the base of your nose here. So a very light, flexible material. This cartilage skeleton allows sharks to be much more flexible in the water and they can turn much sharper. It also makes them lighter, therefore they don't have to work so hard to swim through the water as well. But with the skeletal structure, sharks have very rigid pectoral fins and they cannot move them in the same way that bony fish can. This means that sharks rely solely on their tail fin or their caudal fin to propel themselves forward and therefore they cannot swim backwards. Because of this cartilage structure, this is unfortunately why sharks are the target of the shark finning industry which is looking for that cartilage to add to shark fin soup. Okay let's move on to their basic internal anatomy now which is really interesting and very unique. First of all sharks have a u-shaped stomach and this stomach can actually be everted out of their mouths to reject any poisonous or potentially dangerous objects they may have swallowed. So they can actually regurgitate their stomach out of their mouths, empty it, and then swallow it back down. They also have a small two-chambered heart. And this is quite different to our relatively large four-chambered heart. They only need this small heart since living in the water and living sort of laterally, their heart doesn't have to work so hard to pump the blood around their body. Also, due to most sharks, pretty much constantly swimming around in the water column, that muscle contraction when, as they're swimming actually helps pump the blood around their body. So again, the heart doesn't have to work as hard. One of the most important factors of internal anatomy for sharks is the size of their liver. So sharks have a very large, very oily liver, and this actually gives them buoyancy. Because oil is less dense than water, it floats. So this large oily liver inside sharks give them a lot of buoyancy. See, since they don't actually possess a gas-filled swim bladder like Teleos. Even though they have this oily liver, all sharks are actually still negatively buoyant. That means if they stop swimming, they will sink. And that is why you'll only ever see sharks either swimming around in the water column or resting on the sea floor. However, there is one really interesting anomaly to this, one shark species that just doesn't want to fit in, and that's the ragged tooth shark. Now they really interestingly, they actually come up to the surface and actually gulp air into their stomachs, giving them a 
temporary swim bladder in their stomach because they have this gas giving them buoyancy and this allows them to actually hover just above the sea floor without having to swim to keep them buoyant which is really interesting so another common question i get is where do sharks live do they live in all the oceans do they live in the deepest parts of the ocean so we're going to quickly cover this now there are three main ocean zones that sharks live in first one is the neuretic zone this is the area between the shoreline and the edge of the continental shelf generally anything less than 200 meters of water is considered in the neuretic zone and this is obviously where we get a lot of our shark interactions due to the shallow water this is where we can dive free dive and also a lot of fishing happens so neuretic zone is where we see a lot of the sharks that we know well that includes black tip reef sharks bull sharks hammerhead sharks epaulette sharks those sort of sharks live in the neuretic zone and live relatively shallow water quite close to the coastline now we can move out to the oceanic zone the oceanic zone is everywhere past the continental shelf so water that is deeper than 200 meters oceanic sharks tend to live in that top 200 meters near the sunlight where there is a lot more food available sharks that live in the oceanic zone are sharks like the aptly named oceanic white tip shark blue shark and then finally we've got the sharks that live in the twilight zone and the midnight zone this is all the water past the continental shelf that is deeper than 200 meters so this can go down to 4,000 meters which is the bottom of the midnight zone past that the abyssal zone we don't tend to get any sharks it's thought that the pressure down there is just too much for most fish and most shark species and in fact the amount of food down there is very very minimal it is not thought that any sharks live down in the abyssal zone so in this midnight and twilight zone we get a lot of the much more interesting almost mythical shaped and sort of sizes of sharks so we've got sharks like the goblin shark that extrudes its jaws way past its mouth the mega mouth shark the frilled shark that looks like some sort of alien dinosaur and all of these sharks live at these great great depths under a huge amount of pressure in pretty much zero light conditions and yes sharks do live in all the oceans around the world and in fact some sharks live in some of the rivers around the world as well okay let's move on to senses this is a really interesting topic sharks possess the same five senses we do but all pretty heightened compared to ours but in fact they have two senses that we just don't have but let's cover the main senses that we know of and we're familiar with first and then we'll go into those really unique senses so first of all do they have vision they can see and they actually have extremely good vision in the ocean particularly in low light conditions and this is because they can actually adjust the size of their pupil which most other fish can't and this adjustment of the size of their pupil allows a lot more light into their eyes which means they can see very well in low light or almost no light conditions their smell is also a very useful sense and very important and they can smell very minute amount of fish blood in quite large areas however it is worth stating that their smell is so good that they can actually tell the difference between different types of blood and it's been well reported that sharks have pretty much little or no response to human blood where when they smell fish blood there is a big response because they identify this as a food source next is taste and touch so sharks can taste they have these taste buds that are actually lined around the bottom of their jaw and they have the sense of touch which is similar to ours in terms of they can feel pressure and temperature through their skin their fifth sense which is one of the most underrated is their hearing they have incredibly good hearing even though they don't have any visible ears they don't have external ears they have ears that are set under their skin but they are incredibly sensitive and they are particularly good at picking up low frequency sounds and this is a similar sound to what a fish will make when it is panicking or when it is injured it will be letting off these low frequency thuds as it swims around in the water and sharks are really good at detecting this to move in to the prey so now the two really interesting unique senses they have the first one is electroreception this means they can detect electrical currents which is just incredible so all living animals give off electrical signals through their heartbeat and through muscle contractions this is how we live and sharks can actually detect these electrical impulses only over a very short distance usually about half a meter max a meter but they can actually detect these electrical impulses given off by heartbeats and muscle contractions this allows them to hunt in the sand and actually identify fish that might be under a level of sand and also this allows them to hunt in very very low light or no light conditions because they can actually sense that electrical activity without even seeing the animal there which is just 
incredible. And finally, they can also sense vibrations and they can tell water pressure through what is called their lateral line. And this is a line of minute hair-like cells that runs from the tip of their nose down the side of the shark all the way to their tail. And these hair-like cells can detect pressure changes in the water and vibrations, again, helping them detect injured or panicking fish for them to go and hunt. Okay, so you can see this photo here of this amazing tiger shark coming in for maybe a little test of the camera equipment and you can see those tiny little specks on its nose there those tiny black dots are the ampullae of Lorenzini which detect these electrical impulses now I didn't take this photo but I'm pretty sure I can tell you the story of this photo even though I wasn't there the shark will have been swimming around because there will have been a smell of fish blood in the water because they were probably feeding the shark so it just came in to this diver and this camera equipment just to check out if the smell was coming from then as it got closer to the camera, it would have started to sense those huge amounts of electrical activity that a camera and particularly a strobe or a flash gives off. As it gets really close, it feels that high amount of electrical activity and therefore will just open its mouth to see if there was a, a live fish right in front of its mouth. Okay, let's talk about shark skin. One of the most interesting features of sharks in my opinion. So sharks have an amazingly unique skin. Their skin is actually covered in what we call dermal denticles and that literally translated means skin teeth. So they are covered with these minute tooth-like structures all over their body and these structures perform a certain purpose according to the shark. Some sharks like the nurse shark we see in this photo have large very rounded dermal denticles which are designed to protect that shark from hitting rocks or injuring themselves on coral or other potentially dangerous objects. However, a fast swimming shark like a mako shark would have a very different shaped dermal denticle. Like the image here, this mock-up of a dermal denticle, this is much more suited to a fast swimming shark. And the shape of these dermal denticles have actually been proven to reduce the drag in the water, therefore allowing sharks to swim much faster with much less effort, giving them an advantage over all of the bony fish. And this is just an incredible advantage that sharks have and humans have actually tried to harness this kind of technology and about 20 years ago now a swimsuit came out that was designed using dermal denticles and had the equivalent of dermal denticles covering its material. Now this swimsuit was so successful at making swimmers faster and reducing the drag in the water it was actually banned for competitive athletes because it's giving them an unfair advantage and this is how amazingly unique shark skin is. Dermal denticles also because they are that hard tooth-like structure they tend to protect the sharks from many diseases and parasites as well so it allows sharks to stay healthier too. Now let's move on to a topic that a lot of people like to talk about shark teeth. Now shark teeth are actually very unique to each shark species which is why they are so interesting. So each shark species teeth is going to vary according to the diet of that individual species. So we have some sharks that eat relatively large marine mammals and scavenge a lot. So therefore they need large knife shaped teeth that can cut through flesh and also rip off bits of an animal if they're scavenging. So this is perfect for a great white shark, very large triangular teeth with serrated edges so that it can rip through animal flesh. Then you have other sharks like the ragged tooth shark which has very long pointed teeth acting just like a fork and this is just to pierce and grab the fish they're catching and then swallow them so ragged tooth sharks only eat relatively small fish so all they need to do is grab them with their fork like teeth and then swallow whole the horn shark which eat mainly crustaceans have almost plate like teeth and they are very very flat very very hardened teeth structures that are just used for crushing these crustaceans shell so they can get to the goodness on the inside Side. Now, sharks have multiple rows of teeth in their jaw at any one time. As you can see in the photo here, they have their front teeth, which they're using, but they have up to 30 rows of teeth developing behind each one of those currently used teeth. And they're constantly losing and regenerating teeth. So when one tooth falls out, sometimes within 24 hours, the next tooth will have moved into position to replace that one lost one. And each one of these teeth are on their own conveyor belts. When a shark loses one tooth, that one row of teeth can actually move the next tooth into position without affecting any of the other teeth in the jaw, which is just incredible. 
one of the most interesting questions I get is how do sharks sleep? Sharks don't sleep how we imagine sleep. Sharks go through active and passive states of consciousness. So instead of actually going to sleep like we do, where we go to bed and close your eyes and you are almost unconscious for a certain number of hours, sharks will just lower their activity, lower their brain activity, lower their muscle activity, but they will still be conscious and they'll still be aware of their surroundings, but they'll be in a resting state. And then they'll go through active periods. This is when they will be hunting, interacting with other sharks and fish and being generally more active. So they will interchange between these active and passive states to allow for this recovery. Now, along with this, I want to talk a little bit about their eyes. Now, sharks don't need to blink like we do because we blink to keep our eyes moist from the air around us, where sharks don't need to do this being in water. The reason some sharks have an eyelid, otherwise known as a nictitating membrane, is to protect their eyes from potential harm. They will use this nictitating membrane, which is just a hard case that is underneath the eyeball. And they will pull this up over the eyeball to protect them when they are biting down on prey or any time where there could be a potential for their eye to get injured. Not all sharks have nictitating membranes though. There is a order of sharks called the mackerel sharks which do not possess nictitating membranes. These sharks include mako shark and great whites. And a lot of you probably will have seen this in great white documentaries. Great whites don't have this nictitating membrane, so they actually roll their eyes back into their head and basically expose a hardened side of their eyeball, again, protecting their delicate part of the eye from any sort of injury. Sharks, like all fish, need nice high oxygenated water running over their gills to breathe. Sharks do this in two different ways. When sharks are swimming, they use ram ventilation. This is a very passive form of breathing where sharks will have their mouths slightly open and as they swim forward, the water will run over their gills, allowing constant oxygen transport of this high oxygenated water over into their bloodstream. However, other sharks spend a lot of time on the bottom not swimming, so they need to get that high oxygenated water over their gills another way, and they use a method called buckle ventilation. Buckle ventilation is the action of moving the mouth open and closed, actively pumping water into the mouth and over the gills, getting nice high oxygenated water over the gills for oxygen transport for them to breathe. This is used mainly by benthic species, so bottom dwelling sharks like angel sharks, wobby gongs, nurse sharks, but also by most of the ray species since the majority of ray species are also bottom dwelling. Here we can see a video of a zebra shark buckle ventilating. You can't quite see its mouth, what you can see is the water pumping past those gills allowing oxygen transport for the zebra shark while it's resting on the sea floor. As top predators, sharks need a form of camouflage and they do this in the form of counter shading. And this means they are dark on top and light on the bottom. And this allows them to blend into the ocean whichever direction another animal may be looking at them. So with a light belly from below, they look nice and light which camouflages them against the lightness of the ocean surface. And then they have a dark top, so from above, looking down on top of a shark, that darkness will blend in with the dark depths of the ocean, giving them really good camouflage to avoid predation themselves or also to sneak up on prey and predate successfully. Now, reproduction is one of the most fascinating topics we can talk about when we come to sharks. Sharks use internal fertilization. This is different from most bony fish. Teleos or bony fish use external fertilization where the male and the female release the sperm and the eggs into the water and it is fertilized externally in the water and then drift off on ocean currents. Sharks, however, use internal fertilization. Therefore, the female is actually fertilized by the male during mating and then the fetus or the embryo starts to develop inside the female. Now, once fertilization has happened, the females actually grow their young in three different ways, which is just incredible. So a lot of sharks are what we call oviparous, and this means egg laying. So therefore, the females develop an egg with an embryo inside it, and then when that egg is ready, they will lay the egg among coral, around rocks or seaweed, and that egg will develop externally from the female for up to 12 months before it is born, pops out of the egg, and goes and lives its life on its own. Other sharks are viviparous, which means live born. And this means that the embryos are grown inside the uterus of the female while attached with an umbilical cord to a placenta very similar to how mammals reproduce. And so the pups will develop inside the mother's uterus for up to 24 months for some species. And then when the pups are ready, they will be live born from the mother and will be attached by an umbilical cord until they're born and released into the ocean. And finally, the last group of sharks are called oviviparous, which is really interesting. It's sort of a mix of the last two versions. What happens in oviviparous sharks is that the female develops an egg inside her uterus, but then once the egg is ready to hatch, it will actually 
hatch inside the female and that young pup will be inside the uterus and will feed on other resources inside the female's uterus. This can include unfertilized eggs, fertilized eggs, and even embryos and other fetuses. So actually pups in some oviviparous sharks, such as ragged tooth sharks, actually hunt down and kill and eat their siblings to ensure that they are developing as much as they can and they are born as big and strong as possible, which is why spotted ragged tooth sharks only ever give birth to two young. Their uterus is split up into two compartments, and therefore one pup only ever survives in each compartment, even though they produce a fertilized egg about every day for a few weeks after fertilization. So here we can see a video of a pregnant ragged tooth shark and it is really amazing. You can actually see the baby moving inside the female's uterus. This is very much like when a baby kicks in a mother for us. So just watch very closely. If you look at the side of this ragged tooth, you'll actually see the movement of one of her pups moving up against the wall of her belly. This is incredible and very, very rare footage. We are so lucky to see this behavior in action. So guys, we've come to the end of our interesting facts. I hope you you guys have all really enjoyed it one of my favorite quotes is in the end we will only conserve what we love we will only love what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught and this really does resonate with me and this is why i do these talks so more people can learn and understand about sharks and with this understanding we will love sharks and therefore we will conserve and protect them so i will always want the end message at the end of my talks to be that sharks are essential to the ecosystem they are misunderstood species and they're at high risk of extinction and they need our help and our protection and you as individuals can make a difference. So please make choices today and start doing your bit to help protect sharks. If you've enjoyed today's talk, then please give me a thumbs up on the button below and also click the subscribe button so that you can keep up to date with all of my new talks. I've also sent a link to my tea meal clothing store. So there you can support my talks by buying some ecologically friendly clothing. They're produced in a renewable energy sourced factory. All the materials they use are 100% organic and they don't use any damaging chemicals in their products. The awesome thing with this particularly guys is once you've worn out your clothes you can actually send them back to t-mill and they will reuse them and repurpose them for new clothing and you actually get a five pound voucher back for returning your clothes we need more of this circular fashion so please check out my shop below and buy some of the really cool designs it helps support me and support ecological clothing and circular fashion i've chucked some resources down in the description some websites to check out some of my blogs and more information about my talks click the subscribe button below so you don't miss any of my future talks. Thank you for joining guys and I'll see you in the next one. Now I'm going to tell you a bit a little... If you enjoyed today's talk then please give me a thumbs up and the click... If you've enjoyed... This is usually... And very... Oh, that. Uh, oh, 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 o